Gender equity is a human right and it is central to excellence in patient care. It lifts the economy and it makes our communities healthier and safer. This devastating pandemic has shone a spotlight on inequity, but has also given us a unique opportunity to put things right. In this episode of Code Zero, we discuss the issues of gendered inequity, how it impacts on healthcare providers and healthcare consumers, how it is compounded by racism, violence, and the pandemic. And we ask what each and every one of us can do because each and every one of us has a role. We're proud to collaborate with ComBank on this educational project about gender equity within medicine. We're excited to see the launch of CBA's The Next Chapter program, addressing domestic and financial abuse. I stand on Bunurong country. Chris is on Gadigal country, and our guests come from as far away as Powhatan country. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we stand, and we pay our respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Wherever you are in the world, we ask that you take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which you stand. Welcome to Coda Zero. Welcome to Coda Zero. And welcome to Coda Zero. I'm Jessica Stokes Parrish, and I'll be hosting this conversation about gender equity in healthcare. I'm joined by four fabulous guests. I have Kate Ahmad, neurologist and medical activist. I have Elizabeth Broderick, who is the longest serving sex discrimination commissioner in Australia. She's also the founder of Time's Up Healthcare and is also a lawyer. I'm also joined by Amy Tunig, Gomeroy woman and education academic at the University of Macquarie, or Macquarie University rather. Finally, last but not least, Dr. Lauren Powell, who is a doctor and also the VP of Time's Up Healthcare. If you haven't met me before, I'm a nurse and I'm also the chair for Women in Simulation. So if you're joining virtually, welcome. Well, most of you are joining virtually. And so I thank you for joining us and I encourage you to highlight Coda Zero using the hashtag Coda Zero on all socials. And if you have a question, then please include it on the chat box below the screen that you can see there. And if you see a comment or a question that really interests you, then please vote it up so that we can ask it to our panelists. Now, onto the conversation, because I think we could really spend about four hours discussing all of this content, and I don't want to waste another minute. So first, we're on to Dr. Kate, and our first question is, what has been your experience of training in medicine as a woman? Is sexism subtle or is it overt? I think it's both. So I think that basically you will always have subtle sexism and often this is things like just um, a gender expectation. So you are employing a woman, you are nearly always going to be concerned about is she going to get pregnant, is she going to go and have a baby, go on maternity leave, maybe leave her position. So there's always this slight difference between the way that men and women are perceived. Um, but there's other things as well. So women doctors uh, learn very early on that um, they're often not actually even recognised or seen as a doctor. So we are often thought to be nurses or physiotherapists because they're of more female dominated uh, areas. Um, we'll do a ward round and often it'll be the male medical student to whom all of the questions are directed at because they look more doctorly than the female consultant. Um, we even had a case where a surgeon was operating, doing open heart surgery. She opened the chest, did the surgery, and as she was closing, the male physio student who was observing said to her, oh, do nurses always open the chest? So even after she'd done all of that, he still didn't think she was a doctor. So there's all of this. And then you get patients who are much more likely to comment on your appearance, who are asked, likely to ask you about your relationship status. Um, so things which just undermine the actual position of a woman as a doctor. But then there is overt sexism. And I recently collated the experiences of some um, doctors from medical students all the way up to consultants. And to be honest, they're absolutely horrifying, a lot of them. So um, just as one example, one woman describes a male surgeon um, whom she would assist in theatre. And he would ask her to stand so close to him that he could feel her breasts pressing up against him. And she became so nauseous that she had to take Maxillon before she assisted him in theatre because she was so disturbed by this. So another surgeon didn't let pregnant trainees in his theatre because he considered them to be bad luck. 
Um, so not only sexist, but also impairing the training of these people. Um, and then it's not just other medical staff that women have problems with, it's patients as well. And patients can be quite difficult to manage because there's a power imbalance, so you're treating the patient. And so it's quite hard to discipline a man who might be confused and sick, who gropes you or makes sexually inappropriate comments. One recent example of uh, absolutely blatant sexism and objectification is an orthopaedics textbook that recently came to my attention. So a medical student sent this in to me because this was actually the recommended textbook um, for her university for studying orthopaedics. And as you can see, it's full of scantily clad women who were actually later revealed to be page three models from the UK. Um, and they're wearing see-through tops and hot pants. And even when they're having their fingers um, looked at you can see that you know what you you can see nipples present which is just completely inappropriate so I think that even when we're a medical student level women are being told that no you're not a colleague you're an object and orthopaedics in particular has a woman problem only three percent of orthopaedic surgeons are women and you can see if this is the teaching material it's not going to be a particularly um, appealing culture for women to enter into so we are all aware of these problems, but they've been quite difficult to manage. So female doctors have um, reported actually going to management and saying that these things have happened to them. And they're often told that it's a joke or oh, that, that consultant, he's known for that, he's very handsy. You just have to put up with it. Don't worry about it too much. And in the worst cases, it's turned around so that the female is the problem and not the male who's perpetrated this sexual harassment or abuse. So I think we really need much better systems for calling this out. So we need to protect the women that actually um, come forward and talk about these things. Um, and we need to, I'll just put up, sorry. Um, we need to make sure that other people are calling it out too. So it has to become a normal thing that if you see something which is inappropriate, you actually call it out, um, male or female. You don't just, you know, stand by, keep your mouth shut because that perpetuates the behaviour. And if it's called out in public, it's less likely to have a, a negative impact on the person that's calling it out. Um, we need codes of conduct. So we have them at our hospitals for social media use and behaviour around patients, but we really need them specifically about treatment of women. And there needs to be consequences when things happen which are like this, which are offensive and demeaning. Kate, you touched on um, the fact that orthopaedics, for example, only has, what was it, 3% um, female consultants. So I guess that kind of touches on career progression. And I'm wondering, do women progress in their career the same as men or what are the differences? Well, at the start, so women enter medical school at about the same rate as men, sometimes even a little bit more. So there's no problem with getting into medical school. We are accepting women in. But as they ascend the career ladder, you see this steady rate of attrition as they fall behind their male colleagues. And this is probably a combination of sexism, of a system that's really been set up for and by men, um, and unequal family roles as well. So it's also a societal problem in the background. So we know that um, women in the leadership positions in the hospital, so if you're going all the way up to the CEO, they're only 12.5% of hospital CEOs. And in medical schools, they're only about 28% of the deans of medical schools. And this kind of thing, you know, it, it has big influence on the culture of a place and the curriculum in the medical school. Then you look at specialists and only about a third of specialists are actually female. And it's worse in surgery where only about 10% um, of surgical trainees are female. And this is not because women are not interested in surgery. They cite different reasons. So one is that there's a, there is a boys club culture. It's not particularly welcoming to women. It doesn't necessarily value the attributes that they can specifically offer. The training's really inflexible. So women, a lot of them are gonna get pregnant and have babies. But if that happens to you, you can't move to a different city or state every three to six months. You need to do part-time training some of the time. Um, and these options are not very available. And there's also just blatant gender discrimination where these female trainees are not considered to be as appealing as male trainees. So um, one of our big uh, challenges is actually keeping women in the areas of medicine that they choose because it's really valuable to have women specialists available. Uh, we know that some female patients, many female patients prefer to see a woman doctor. We know that female physicians and surgeons often have better patient outcomes. So there's been several studies which have actually shown a slightly increased um, 
better outcome in patients treated by female physicians. So we need diversity. And just along that point, these problems are actually much more um, worse in people of a non-white background. So there's a combination of things, but generally, um, you know, we've got racism, sexism and societal inequity, which is influencing the way that women progress in medicine. It's really interesting too that you raise these percentages because often even in nursing, there's an assumption that nursing doesn't have a gender equity problem. And the interesting thing is when you look at the statistics, although there are fewer men within the nursing profession, which is something we'd like to rectify, it's the men that typically climb to the top. Now, you, you kind of touched on this negative impact on medical training, et cetera. I'm just wondering in terms of conferences, what, what are the negative impacts or the barriers around that? Um, well, when we think about medical conferences, um, we think about um, firstly who attends them and then who are the speakers and the panels that are at those conferences. So when you think about attendance, to attend a medical conference, you need to have free time and you need to be able to get there. And the problem for women is that a lot of the time they are the carers of their children and that is often unequal. Even if they have partners at home, the burden of caring for the children falls on the woman. Also, the majority of single parents are also female. So that means that you have to find childcare. We know that some conferences are starting to offer childcare and things like lactation rooms, but it's certainly not the um, norm. And then it often um, incurs an extra cost. So you've got to pay for the childcare as well as paying for the very expensive mm -hmm. conference and all of the travel that comes along with it. So even just attending can be a, a difficult for women. Then you've got your speakers and your panels. So we know that women are underrepresented as speakers. So about one third of speakers at medical conferences are women. Um, and then it gets even worse when you look at things like panels. So everyone's heard of the manual where it's all men. There are about 35% of um, panels at conferences. Only about 2 to 3% are all women. So that's a pretty concerning statistic. Um, compounding that, often those panels are all white as well. So you've got all white men on a panel, which doesn't really give you um, a nice, diverse uh, sort of opinion on what's being talked about. So. Um, the problem here is that if you don't have women speakers and women experts getting up and talking, you don't have role models for junior doctors and scientists that are up and coming, and you don't hear women's voices and perspectives on these medical issues. Uh, the other, when you're at a conference, often it's where you network with colleagues from around the, the country or the globe, and it's where you collaborate on things like research projects. So if you're not up there being heard, then you won't get the same amount of things like job opportunities and you won't get the same research opportunities. So what we thought was that even with conferences, people do select male speakers more, often because they're more visible in the community. It's not necessarily a deliberate thing. It's sometimes a subconscious bias. So we've actually set up um, Women Speakers in Healthcare, which is an organisation where we've actually got a database of women experts who are willing to speak at conferences. And then if people are setting up a conference and realise that they've got a manual or that they've got all male speakers, they can actually come to us and we can help them find a female speaker to try and address this inequality. Fantastic. Um, I could see the rest of our panellists were nodding in agreement. And I'm just wondering, Lauren, if you have something to add there, especially from that medical perspective. Yes, I, I want to appreciate um, Kate's comments so much. Um, so many of the challenges that, that you uh, spoke on are a direct mirror reflection of the challenges we see in the U.S. healthcare system as well. Um, the challenges of women trying to ascend to uh, the top to break the proverbial glass ceiling, um, challenges both mirrored in um, the medical field and, and with nursing and with um, physicians, as well as in public health. Um, that we know public health here is overwhelmingly made up of women. When we go to any school public health, overwhelmingly we see women there. But when it comes to leadership, we do not see enough women. Um, everything that you, you touched on uh, is, is spot on and everything that, that we're also seeing in the United States. That's also what Times of Healthcare uh, really was created to, to fight against and um, to create gender equity in the healthcare workplace. And we are thinking about so many of the challenges that you have brought up 
inclusive of the childcare crisis that we're seeing right now, um, the challenges that COVID has has uh, resurfaced. And really, I think it's important that we recognize many of these challenges have been here all along, right? It's just that there was only a small section of the population perhaps who really had to deal with this every day. Um, so childcare crises, pay inequities, um, requesting and kind of pushing for hazard pay for our healthcare workers who are really putting their lives on the line as they continue to do their jobs and try to keep all of us safe. So I see so many parallels um, in many of the comments that you made. I think we'll hold that thought around how COVID is highlighting those deeply embedded um, inequities because Liz is gonna take us through some of that. We've got some questions from the audience. The first one I think segues beautifully into what you've talked about, Lauren. How do we get more females into leadership roles in healthcare? What's your take on that, Lauren? Sure. Um, well, I think first and foremost, you know, it's really important that we continue to raise awareness. Uh, it kind of sounds really like uh, surface level maybe, but I think there's still a need to continue to raise awareness of the fact that there are not enough women in leadership to begin with. Um, when we look around, um, your statistics that you shared were, were so um, interesting and they're even worse in the United States. Um, I think percentages of women who are in, in executive positions in healthcare are in the single digits. So um, I think it's first and foremost, continuing to raise awareness that there is a problem. Um, but then we really have to look at the ways that promotions are, are, are um, happening. Like what is a decision process and what is a, the decision making process behind promotion? Um, what are the intrinsic qualities that are um, that, that folks are looking for to promote women into leadership? Um, and I think by and large, when we go back, we will find the old boys network is, is what has uh, created such a smooth transition for so many men into these positions. Um, and so I think this takes pushing many of our boards, um, the boards of hospitals and the boards of our healthcare organizations. I think um, thinking about sort of the accreditation processes for many of our healthcare organizations and making gender equity, as well as so many other um forms of equity that we need to see within these systems, making those things that those systems have to be held accountable for um, in order to be accredited. Um, and then creating more of a pipeline and opportunities for women to, to lift as we climb, right? To pull others up as we are then ascending into the next position. Thank Can you. I just add, yes. Lauren, because I agree with all that and everything that Kate says, I see it in every industry, to be honest, not just healthcare. But I think we have to be more disruptive and more radical. And the fact that healthcare is a situation where women deliver global health and men lead it, that is so unacceptable given the number of women in the sector. It's a highly feminized sector, yet it's still men who lead it. So I think we need to look at targets, quotas, whatever you want to say, I call it, because the fact is the talent's there. It's just that the way the whole system's constructed means that women are either intentionally or unintentionally excluded. And that's, what le that's what's leading to the current situation. So I think we have to disrupt. I think we need men on board as well. Um, and we really need to set some hard targets and quotas uh, because it's not, a fa it's not a situation where we have no female talent. We've got huge female talent. It's just not going, getting to the top. Thank you so much, Liz. That segues perfectly into the final question for Kate, which is, what's your advice to male leaders in medicine? How do we respond? Um, that's a tough one. I think there are some male leaders in medicine who are not going to be particularly receptive to the idea of increasing women in medicine. I've actually heard some of them say things like women don't want leadership roles. They just choose not to go into them. So I think there are people there that are almost unreachable to a degree. There are certainly allies and these people are really important because they can also help in mentoring the younger generation of male uh, physicians and surgeons who are ascending up the healthcare ladder because we need to actually change the whole culture, I think, to, to really see change at the top. Um, obviously, you have to be conscious of this. You can't just, it's a bit like racism. You can't just say, 
I'm not racist, I'm not sexist, and because I don't do anything bad to other people, you actually have to go out of your way to address the issues. So male leaders need to actually make sure that they are selecting women for conference presentations and that they are looking at women in an equal way when they're selecting people for jobs. Um, and I think what Lauren said about looking at the at healthcare accreditation and actually making gender equity a really important and objective measure might actually go some way to seeing some progress and disrupt. I like that a lot. I think disruption is great. Yep. So um, I just want to thank Coda Zero for this fantastic panel that is made up of all women. Well done. Um, let's move on to Liz now. Now, in your role with the UN and chair of the Working Group on Discrimination, you see every day how the pandemic is affecting women and girls. What are you seeing? Yeah, thanks very much, Jess. And uh, can I first say that I agree with everything that Kate said and also Lauren. So it's great to be here with everyone. Um, what are we seeing as a result of the pandemic? And just to give you an idea about my global role, I'm now chair of um, the uh, group of special rapporteurs who make up the working group on discrimination against women and girls. So I'm looking at um, the uh, status of women and girls in it pretty much every nation of the world. And every night I'm receiving information um, about human rights violations that are happening against women and girls in so many different countries. I write to the um, leader of that nation, so to the Prime Minister, the President, the head of a nation state, drawing to their attention things that are happening and asking um, for uh, the matters to be investigated. So in that role, um, I'm seeing uh, uh, that we have two opportunities here. Um, you know, we can create a post-COVID world which deepens the structural inequality and discrimination against um, women and girls, or indeed we can choose to do something differently. So it's presenting both challenges and opportunities. And just to give you an idea about that, two weeks ago I presented to the UN Human Rights Council, which is the UN's major body on protecting human rights across the world. It's based in Geneva. Ordinarily at this time of year I'd be living in Geneva presenting in person, but this time I went in by video link which I have to say was a pretty surreal experience. Um, everyone from the president to each ambassador speaking through a mask um, and an eerie emptiness in the chamber, which is a chamber that's ordinarily filled with a lot of noise, sometimes a lot of hostile energy, um, but definitely, definitely a lot of chatter. So, um, and ordinarily I'd be sitting down in the front of a chain, chamber with a, with a number of advisors um, responding to nation states. Uh, this time I was actually locked down here in Sydney with my dog on the couch. So I have to say it was not for the faint hearted. <laughs> but the picture that I came away with from there was absolutely clear. And this was in four hours of interactive dialogue with different countries around the world. And that is that this pandemic, um, I think as Lauren had said, it's exposed pre-existing gender inequalities. It's not that these things were new, but they've been shared, they've really, there's been a stark um, light shone on these inequalities. And they are, what I came away from that knowing is that these inequalities are becoming more deeply entrenched in every region of the world. And of course, not all women will experience discrimination to the same extent or in the same ways. We do know that women experiencing multiple forms of discrimination, so women of colour, migrant women, Indigenous women, women with disability or LGBT women, will be impacted to a much greater degree by, um, by this pandemic. Um, and so what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing a dramatic increase in women's caregiving responsibilities, and Kate talked about that. I mean, with lockdown and quarantine, we have children out of childcare, we have more homeschooling, we particularly women are looking after elderly um, relatives because of their increased vulnerability and everyone's in the house. So that um, domestic load goes up. And it's interesting to see that here in Sydney with some research which will be released in the next couple of weeks um, from Professors Ray Cooper and Lynn Craig, that shows that here in Australia, before COVID, women were spending around 1.7 hours more per day on care and housework than men, 1.7 hours more. Following COVID, it's increased another 50%. So we know that women's unpaid care and domestic responsibility has increased dramatically as a result of COVID. 
The other thing we're seeing is a rise in an already epidemic of sexual and domestic violence. And I, I was just speaking to the CEO of Medibank last week, who tells me that their 1800 Respect line, which is the um, call line here in Australia, the number of calls to it have increased 65% in the last few months as a result of lockdown. We're also seeing the continued feminization of poverty. The fact is, in most countries of the world, um, there's a larger proportion of women in precarious work, in low-income work, in casual work. That's um, the case across the healthcare sector as well. When I look at aged care, um, early childhood education and care, so those women are losing their jobs at a much higher rate than men. And not only that, they're disproportionately represented in the frontline essential workforce of the pandemic. Um, and as one commentator put it, um, he said, women deliver global health, but men lead it. And I couldn't agree more. We've just heard about all the statistics around that. And particularly, uh, not just in healthcare, but aged and disability care, um, cleaning, retail, teaching, um, early childhood education. So the, just two other things I'd like to say about the, um, the deepening of inequality is where are the women in the national rebuilding and recovery efforts, mm. the global mm. efforts, the national efforts? They're just not there. There are very small numbers of women who are helping in the rebuilding, and that's worrying me that we will rebuild nations where women will not be actively and intentionally included. Um, and that'll be particularly the case if they can't access reproductive health care. As you'll know, many um, nations are deeming, uh, for example, abortion as elective surgery, therefore no longer available, which disproportionately impacts on poor women. Mm. And overall, I think it's jeopardising women's safety, well-being, their economic security and their ability to participate in political and public life. So, they're the challenges. I mean, as the world gears up for, um, for uh, you know, um, recovery, there will be some opportunities. I see the opportunities for women, particularly in um, uh, the technology area, because if we've looked at flexible work, working from home, those types of things, technology is enabling that more more broadly, technology is allowing women to collectively organise mm. and also the women's, particularly young women, their activism and their movements, the cross-movement building and whatever is being very much enabled by technology as well. So there are some of the issues um, around uh, uh, what's happening with women in COVID. Elizabeth, you had a, a very large role as the longest serving sex discrimination commissioner in Australia. And as part of that, you established the Male Champions of Change group. Um, you've also created a, a healthcare sector section of that organisation. Is it really a men's problem? Like, isn't gender equity a women's problem? No, it's a great question because for many um, I think for many people, they think, well, actually, gender equality is a women's problem. It's women. Um, and let's face it, it's women that's got us most of the rights that we have in the world today. Um, the collective action of women, that's because, you know, women that I will never know cared enough to demand change several generations ago. But I think when we just conceive it as a women's problem, um, our ability to make progress is limited. The fact is, this is a key economic and social issue. And we need men because men have power and this is about the redistribution of power either in organisations, in nations. We need men with power to step up and take the message of gender equality to other men. And it's interesting, Kate was talking about how do we shift men um, who are leaders in healthcare. Well, that's very much where the Male Champions of Change strategy is about. It's about recognising that in all our most of our organisations, it's men largely, not exclusively, but it's men largely that hold the levers of, cha uh, levers of power. So if we want to shift power, we need those men to work with us. And so we developed a group in the healthcare group. Um, we actually started very small several years ago. We started with about six men. We now have about 260 of the nation's most powerful leaders. Uh, we've got groups also in Pakistan, in the Philippines, and a global tech group out of the US and the UK. Um, but those men come together in uh, small groups, um, firstly, to learn about the, 
the uh, complexity of gender equality because it's a hugely complex area. So it's an incubator for them to learn, but that for them to then step up and take strong action. And just to give you some examples of what the health group have been doing, I mean, coming back to Kate's point about conferences, it's so true. The fact is, if you want to have a strong career, you need visibility in public life, and that's speaking at conferences and other things. And what we're finding is that many conferences are all male speakers. So taking the panel pledge, that is, I pledge never to speak at a conference which has a mantel or um, where women's voices are not well represented, that costs nothing and it's a starting point. Um, that's one thing. Eliminating everyday sexism, calling it out, um, you and men calling it out, because the one thing is a woman to call it out, but another for a man of power to say, that actually is not working. Um, one healthcare CEO recently told me he was involved with a group who were having a discussion in the workplace and one of the men that was part of that discussion told a sexualized joke. Now, we've all been in that situation. He said what happened next was that the men laughed and then all the women that were part of the conversation laughed, so he laughed too. And then when he went to those women subsequently in the next week, um, to get some feedback, because that's one of the things you've got to do as a male champion, get feedback on how you're leading on gender equality. Those women said to him, you know what, you're really letting us down. They said, remember when, you know, that bloke told the sexualized joke and you laughed? He said, yeah, I laughed because you women laughed. They said, no, we women, we laugh because we have to fit in. But when you laugh as the leader of this organisation, you're absolutely letting us down. And I think it's those micro moments when um, men need to step in, speak up um, and uh, learn from those as well. As he said to me, Liz, what I learned from that is I'll never, you know, I, I never want to be part of a conversation that I wouldn't be happy to have my daughter part of as well. So I think men have a really important role to play. And here in Australia, we're trying to accelerate change through the disruptive action of men. Now, just briefly before we move on to questions um, from the audience, you presented findings of a 12-month consultation in the region of the world on women's rights in changing the world work. In your presentation to nation states, you said, creating a world of work where women benefit and contribute on an equal basis with men requires reimagining the structure of work and the economy with, human, with women's human rights placed front and centre. What is good for gender equality is good for the economy and society as well. What does a world of work that benefits men and women equally look like and how do we get there? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's interesting to see because the world of work as it's constructed now is one which is, was created by men, is largely run by men, um, and now we need to shift it. We need to shift it to ensure that women are central to the way work's constructed, not to preference women. But what we know is when women's human rights are front and centre, everyone benefits, men, families, societies, and also economies. So really the five things that we need to do um, to uh, develop that um, world of work is, firstly, we need to ensure that freedom from violence and harassment, um, not only is it a basic human right, but it's a lived reality for everyone, but particularly for women every day. And that means prioritising prevention and survivor-centred responses to sexual harassment. And I'd say that's particularly in new forms of work like the gig economy. So that's important. The second thing is we need to... Um, redistribute unpaid care and domestic work between men and women. Mm. Um, as I said before, at the minute, you know, our economy thrives on women's unpaid um, domestic work. It doesn't come into our analysis of productivity or anything else. So what we need is an investment in care services as well as universal access to a full range of parental leaves, maternity, paternity leave, um, so the better, sh and most importantly, the better sharing of paid and unpaid work between men and women. The third thing we really need to do is to disrupt patterns of women's and men's work. So at the minute, the healthcare sector is very feminised environment um, and some other sectors um, are very, uh, you know, have predominance of men in those sectors. What we need to do is to disrupt so that both men and women 
can work in high value roles um, from caring right through to really strong technical roles as well. And then we have to, the next thing we need to do is ensure that all women workers can enjoy their rights without discrimination. And that includes informal workers. In many countries of the world, women's work is in the informal sector. And I'm thinking there particularly about migrant workers who are working in domestic work, in care work. Um, they have no access to social, social protection. So that needs to change. And then finally, I think we have to support women's collective action and organising. Um, and you know, that, that that's just so important and particularly so that women can actually be employed in decent work with terms and conditions. So, as I said, um, work the, the, that's on the back of women is currently sustaining entire economies, yet it remains undervalued mm. um, and invisible. And without some concerted action, uh, there is a significant danger that the current gender inequalities that we have um, will not only be replicated, but they'll be amplified into the future. And that's something we all need to do something about. We have a question from the, the audience. You've been on the inside and closer to the power than the rest of us. How do we get those in power to listen to us? Yeah, it's it's such a great question. And I sometimes, I mean, I, I ask myself that because you're right, I, you know, because of my roles, I have been able to work within the, um, not the corridors of power, but within the institutions of power. Um, and I think part of it is helping people see that the, 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 the suggestions that we have, that the work we're leading to is not about preferen preferencing women above men. Um, it's actually about lifting whole economies, whole nations. It's about lifting families because, you know, even in the family setting and many countries of the world will um, believe that gender equality is destroying the very institutions on which their countries are based, including the family. Um, they'll say they want to protect the family, therefore they can't engage in, you know, women's rights. If you help people see that actually particularly during this pandemic, if a family has two incomes, then one, one of the partners loses their income, the family's not thrown into poverty. There's an example of gender equality being protective of a family. You know, when women are educated in the family, then it's more likely that their children will be educated. That's an example of building resilience into the family. So I think it's just coming back to um, uh, working with, you know, even from the family units right up to the country level, um, just helping see that it's not a zero-sum game between men and women, but this is all of us together lifting economies. We want prosperous economies. We want socially cohesive nations. And the work um, that we're doing can actually promote this. And at the end of the day, because um, you'll usually get three groups, one who are really on board, a bulk of group that sit in the middle who are saying, oh, well, will we be able to just sit this out? The organisation says it's committed to it, but I don't really believe it. I'll just sit here and plot it out. And then you've got the ones who just don't get it at all. Um, my suggestion to the ones that just don't get it is they either need to take their skills somewhere else than your organisation. But that middle group, you can really shift them by engaging them in the human story. So what is the harm that's currently happening in this organisation on our watch? The levels of sexual harassment, the levels of exclusion and mental health. Let's start telling the stories um, of the impact of a current culture because it needs to shift to be more inclusive of women and, you know, those men particularly and also women who have power need to use their power to shift that organisation. So I think we need both a head and a heart connection that's the way that I've learned it's the best to move people on. So speaking of the power of stories, we now move on to Amy Tunig. Um, your TED Talk, Amy, highlighted the foundational inequality within Australian systems and societal structures. How does a legacy of white supremacy impact healthcare in 2020? Yeah, so just want to say, um, amazing panel from Kate and Elizabeth so far. I'm really enjoying hearing what everyone has to say. Um, and 
It's so troubling, you know, as Elizabeth saying and Lauren has mentioned, the way we see the same power imbalances repeated again and again and again, whether it's education or healthcare or politics or even just discussions around what should a home and a family look like. And uh, I was thinking about, you know, there's often controversy around things like singing the Australian anthem, right? And something that people are taught about Australia is that we are young and we are free. Um, I I disagree with both of those things. This continent is home to the oldest continuous cultures in the world. Over 100,000 years of amazing community has taken place and is taking place on these lands. But what is young are our systems that we're currently um, experiencing this inequality and oppression within. And that has two, there's two sides to that. Firstly, um, it's terrible what's happening, but on the other hand, it's a young system. So being disruptive and pushing back shouldn't be seen as threatening as it is um, if people genuinely are on board in terms of wanting to work together for us to have that even playing field. However, if it feels threatening for us to talk about pushing for equality, then perhaps people feeling threatened aren't that on board with us actually being treated equally. So within the healthcare system, when I think about the legacy and the ongoing racism, I think about people like Naomi Williams, a Wiradjuri woman who in New South Wales died because she was repeatedly refused treatment in hospital. Um, her and her unborn son died of, of septicemia. Um, I think about my own mother who uh, attended at least eight different emergency departments over two years uh, and was constantly sent away with Panadol. Uh, I, I think about women and black women whose pain is ignored and when you sit in that intersection of Indigenous or black and being a woman, how often you're seen as just there for pain relief. It turned out my mum had, um, they don't stage lymphoma, but stage the equivalent of stage four lymphoma. She was given three months to live. Um, but it took years and she was in so much pain and she was constantly dismissed. And so I think about how we live today in systems that are led by often white men and they're populated with research that has involved primarily studies, Lauren and I were talking about this earlier, that are populated primarily with white men uh, and data and teaching, you know, from the training level, whether it's a tertiary hospital or we're going back to an undergraduate perspective where you can go through your whole degree without ever having um, a, a woman professor, let alone an Indigenous woman professor, lead and teach you elements of what you're there to learn in the health faculty and uh, field. And the way that that comes together so that Indigenous peoples, Indigenous women and women in general will experience being dismissed, being disregarded and often having really basic boundaries crossed. Um, I live in a semi-regional area, so we only have one major hospital here. I'm well qualified in terms of the Western system. I've got a couple of degrees. Um, but that doesn't stop specialists when I go to see them from putting aside my humanity because they see the word Aboriginal on my documentation and they think, well, this is a good time. Like you've waited six months for this appointment. You're in a lot of pain, but I think this is a good time for me to ask you if you'll come in and do cultural training for my staff. Uh, you know, this crossing of boundaries is something that we experience a lot and it's quite literally killing us. Uh, and it is reflective of the systems being built in a time where Indigenous people weren't counted as people. You know, my grandfather, when he was born, we still weren't counted as people here. And that legacy lives on because at no point have we kind of stopped the system, rebooted it, booted out the people who were writing the papers, dehumanising us. Like, that's never happened. And so you have the same teachings that are really deeply embedded within these systems now. Um, perpetuating the harm. Um, Amy, you touch on this almost double whammy of being both female and Indigenous. Can you tell us more about how your experiences are different to those of a non-Indigenous woman like myself? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, something, a saying that I think would hit home for a lot of black women and Indigenous women is um, what police are to black men, doctors are to black women. 
Um, so the violence that we experience in the system is, I mean, women in general do experience a lot of violence within the medical system. I mean, you take something like endometriosis, which is debilitating. We've known about it for so long, and yet the research and the the awareness of it generally is just not there, right? So women in general have a really hard time within medical fields trying to get help. But for Indigenous women, we also experience the fear of navigating systems that actively do harm to us. So, you know, within Australia, we have the era known formally as the stolen generations. But what a lot of people don't realise is the stolen generations didn't stop more Aboriginal children are removed today than during that era. And so as an Aboriginal mother, I know that when I enter any system run by the state, so the public health system, I'm at risk because I'm white passing. So I'm not likely to be stopped on the street by a police officer, but I'm very much seen as Aboriginal in the health system. It's there in my medical records. If you ask me my medical history, I am stereotypically Aboriginal. You know, my grandfather has diabetes, you name it. But I'm also at risk from the harm that we know is perpetuated against Aboriginal women and mothers. So it, it inhibits your ability to be open with your doctors because if I let on that I'm really stressed and overwhelmed, is that going to result in a report to community services because I'm also a mother? If I don't agree with your diagnosis about my child or what you're recommending, I'm more likely to experience the threat of, well, we're going to contact community services. You're going to do it my way. I know because I'm friends with lots of white women who are also parents that the way I experience the health system as a mother is different. Mm. I know it's, it's different for myself. Um, I was thinking about, uh, so during my pregnancies, I experienced hyperemesis gravidium, have you say it, HG. So I was a regular in my ED getting drips, couldn't keep anything down the whole time. And uh, a doctor who saw me once during that time called me up a few months later to ask to store their furniture in my garage while they went on holiday. <laughs> like, my injuries are so regularly crossed. I was getting a test last year and the nurse who was putting the radioactive stuff into my body was looking at my chart while they were putting the needle in. Said, oh, you're Aboriginal. My daughter is very interested in Aboriginals. Can I give them your number? And when you're in these positions, the power imbalance is, is unavoidable. Mm. You know, if I say no, well, I've got to lay on this slab thing under this machine for, you know, hours. This person has a needle they can poke me with. Will I be dismissed? Will my report not be done properly if I piss you off? Um, and, and so you're forced to then be that person who, who says, oh, yeah, sure, no, you can totally breach my confidentiality and my ability to access healthcare safely because your offspring thinks my culture is interesting. Um, and so I think it's that, that extra layer of systemic harm, constant fear of, of, of threat and of um, state intervention and the need to just get help because there's something wrong with your body and like health isn't my thing. I can't diagnose myself. Um, and I do think that that intersectionality is where the violence and the risk and the, um, the trauma is increased. Amy, thank you for sharing those stories. That is just utterly shocking and unacceptable. Um, I guess from your perspective as an academic working in educational systems, what is the role of academia and higher education in disrupting those systems or, you know, to achieve equality and health? Yeah, so, I mean, for health um, professionals, whether you're in research or you're in that public interface as a healthcare provider, I think education is really important. So starting at that foundational level of how we train up health professionals, we need more Indigenous healthcare professionals mm. in academia. Um, we're 0.3% of the higher education workforce, um, Indigenous academics. Um, we have quite a few Indigenous people in health um, particularly in nursing and um, in medicine in general, we need to see more people trained up and supported to last in academia. Academia is, we have high attrition rates because it's a quite a violent space for Indigenous people. 
Um, we then also need the non-Indigenous people teaching and working in health to unpack some of their own bias. And, you know, I, I do have quite a lot of sympathy for people who did go through their training 20, 30 years ago and were taught overtly racist and dehumanising things because they're carrying that around because someone handed that to them in their training. Mm. So we need we need some work for people to be unpacking their own racism um, because there's no way there's no way the average doctor is going to say to a white man, "Hey, I, I treated you that one time at the hospital. Can I use your garage as storage?" You know, these boundaries are breached because we're objectified and dehumanized. Mm. Um, and I think that academia has a big part to play in that, but not just in the teaching perspective, but also within research. If you want to research Indigenous people, there are grants, right? Like it is a tasty area for mm. researchers. They love a nice APSI grant. But where are the Aboriginal people at the start? Where are the people and the collaboration to make sure the questions you're asking haven't already been asked, to make sure that the data you're gathering is actually appropriate and to make sure that it's ethical? Because in the same way that we have manuals, it's really common for at conferences to watch an all-white panel of professors talk about an Indigenous people study. Um, and you sit there and you're like, that's wrong, that's wrong, no, that's not what that word means. Uh, and this flows on into the healthcare sector because how that data is then interpreted is wrong. It's, it's misunderstood. You've misunderstood the words used or you've been given incorrect information because the way you approach the community, you weren't actually trusted. So I think that it's very much an interweaving of making sure that research is done in a more ethical way, that we have more partnerships and collaboration, that academia becomes safer so that we can have Indigenous prof professors in the field. And then we need all of the healthcare professionals out there to go and engage in their own personal and professional development beyond what your workplace is making you mm. do, like the two box or the one day training, so that you can engage in your own learning and keep yourself up to date on the history and the present of black politics here, because that impacts our health. And so it, it's important for you to know when you're treating us and also working with us as colleagues. Lauren, do you have anything to add from your perspective as a, a black woman in America? I, I've just been sitting here, I feel like shaking my head vigorously. I, I feel like Amy is my sister from another mother because the the experiences are just identical, it feels like. Um which which really tells me that you know anti-black racism is a global issue. Hmm. It is it is not something that can be couched in one particular country or one particular corner of the world. Um Every single thing that, that Amy has said, from her experiences um, seeking health care, from the um, you know conditions that are prominent within her her family, within within her community, to uh, the challenges within the system of health care and the lack of diversity and the lack of representation from the way that communities are exploited, it is as though we're living the same existence just on different sides of, of the world. Um, and so I see so many parallels, uh, which is is even more disturbing to me um, to see just how insidious racism is and, and how much of an intricately um, and generationally constructed system it is that still continues to work perfectly today. Yes. And, you know, I would add to that, Lauren, um, you know, I think that a Eurocentric lens watching us talk right now would be tempted to think, ooh, black people on different continents share deficits. And it's like, no, we share the experiences of colonization. So it's that flipping of the script to not go deficit model of Indigenous and black peoples and instead go, what is it about these systems, the way they operate and the way we deliver it that's causing harm globally to black and Indigenous peoples? I couldn't agree with you more. Look, there's a, there's a fantastic question here, Amy, for you from the audience, which is how can we use our privilege as white women to elevate women of colour and particularly from First Nations communities in Australia? 
Yeah, great question. Um, and I would refer to something that Elizabeth mentioned earlier about the importance of men speaking up. It's the same for non-Indigenous people speaking up for Indigenous people. So not talking for us, but calling out like in that example about the man who waited and said, oh, well, the women have laughed, now I'll laugh too. So the power imbalance is what's key there. So whether it's in a workplace or you've got a patient, see another nurse watching the nurse and they were watching, like I watched the other nurse watch and then not intervene, which meant that I spent the whole day not trusting either of them. Mm. Um, she didn't say anything. Now, my fear was that she would go home and think, oh, well, my colleague asked that Aboriginal woman and she was fine with it. I wasn't fine with it. I was in a vulnerable position and didn't feel it was safe to say no. So within my work, um, so I've just completed a national study around the country where I spoke with Indigenous academic women. And something that come up a lot was basic support in the workplace is often predicated on something as ridiculous as being liked. So if you're not liked or perceived as liked, if you're not smiley, if you don't code switch, if if you're seen as the angry or the apathy black woman, you're not going to get any support. And so we often don't have the power to call it out in that time when we're in precarious workplace or we're the patient. You do. Talk up, say, you know, that's a really racist comment. And then don't turn to the Indigenous people and be like, don't you think? Come on into the conversation. Just call it out. That was really racist. Hey, you've actually written a slur into this study. Um, let's take that out. Speak up when you when you see racism. Speak out when you see sexism because we have a power imbalance in that situation. Uh, and then also amplify. So if you're at that table and you're part of a research group who want to get that grant or the ARC or whatever it is involving Indigenous people, at that point before you write the grant, say, Who's a great Indigenous researcher I can bring in? What's a great Indigenous organisation we can partner with? You know, speak up in those early days before we've been dragged to the table at the last minute as an RA or in, in your, your practice or wherever you are. Speak up because just because I'm sitting there smiling doesn't mean that I agree. It means that I'm in a vulnerable position. Oh, strong call to action there, Amy. Thank you so much. So we're going to move on to last but not least, Dr. Lauren Powell. So Lauren, the question, the first question I have for you is, what does hate look like in our world today? Well, uh, first, um, thank you for, for the panel. Thank you you for the excellent conversation already. Um, I think the, the groundwork has really already been laid to sort of start to answer that question. And, and I feel like what, what hate looks like in the world today is pain. Um, we see pain on, on multiple levels right now. We see pain globally as a result of COVID. We see pain globally as a result of the marginalization of women and girls globally. We see pain as a result of racism and, and colonization and, and generations of exploitation of people. I think at the core of it, hate looks like pain. Um, I, I think about sort of my own experiences and, and kind of reflect on like, who does hate really hurt? Um, I think hate has hurt me. So I have had experiences very similar to, to Amy in, in seeking healthcare and, um, you know, going in vul vulnerable moments to seek the help of, of healthcare professionals who at those, at those very moments really have um, your life in their hands. And um, to be questioned or to be scrutinized for my pain to not be taken seriously or um, to be told um, or asked, can I afford an ambulance ride? Maybe I should just hold off on the pain that I'm feeling um, and to know intrinsically that um, I, I was in danger, right? Um, hate, that is hate to me. The, the fact that you would question mm -hmm. my pain that, that you would think that somehow perhaps I can tolerate pain more than others. That is also um, a hallmark of white supremacy and ties all the way back to slavery. Um, it ties back to the experiences of, of slaves being experimented on. Um, a, a man who was heralded as being uh, the father of gynecology, J. Marion Sims, really rose to fame, a white man rose to, to fame um, because of the many sort of techniques and that we still use today in um, the GYN sort of specialty 
um, that he created using the bodies, exploiting the bodies of, of African women, of black women, um, oftentimes doing surgery and procedures on them without using any anesthesia. No anesthesia, multiple times. It is said that he operated on one of his um, subjects more than 40 times with no anesthesia. And so when I am in pain um, and my pain is questioned, that heralds back to the treatment of an entire group of people as a commodity, as livestock. Um, and so hate hurts me and I think hate looks like pain. Hate also hurts my community. Um, when I think about how COVID is impacting Black America right now, um, the impacts of COVID um, on African Americans, on Latinx communities, on communities of color, indigenous communities here, um, it is terrible. It is so bad that we are not even counted. There are still challenges with um, transparency and data with knowing how many cases there actually are in black communities, with knowing how many deaths there actually have been in black communities. Um, and we know that COVID is complicated by underlying chronic conditions. Hmm. Um, and as a result of systems, not as a result of race, it is actually as a result of racism that black people in America are more prone to disease, to hypertension, um, to underlying uh, cardiology challenges. And that is a result of a system that does not equally distribute healthy food options, that does not equally distribute the opportunity to live in safe and clean housing, that does not um, equitably distribute the opportunity for education. Um, and so all of that combined in this moment, along with the fact that there are so many African-Americans, overwhelmingly women in fact, who are on the front lines right now, not only in frontline healthcare worker positions, but on front lines in essential roles, working as um, cashiers in grocery stores, working as attendants in gas stations, working in positions that are hourly wage paying, do not come with health insurance benefits, does not pay enough to live on uh, a reasonable salary, places these individuals back into cycles of poverty and ultimately does not create the opportunity to live a healthy and stable and well life. And to me, that's also what hate looks like. The fact that you are stripping away the opportunity for me to live a well, a, a good intended life and a life that gives me the opportunity to achieve wellness. And finally, I think that hate hurts you. Hmm. It hates, it hurts all of us. Hate hurts all of us because what we're ultimately seeing right now in the midst of COVID and in the, the overlap of racism and the overlap of, um, you know, the uprising post George Floyd, what we're ultimately seeing so interestingly to me is, is a, an illustration of population health. That is that my health is dependent on my neighbor's health. And if my neighbor isn't healthy, then I'm at risk too. Well, it's the same way when we when we think about racism, we think about these systems of oppression. If if I'm not safe, neither are you, because we all have to live in this world together. Mm. And so what what puts me at risk puts you at risk. If I am not safe, none of us are safe. And so ultimately, hate hurts all of us. I'll stop there for the moment. What you touch on there is so um, fascinating and interesting because we do see this dialogue of individualism when it comes to health and, um, you know, it, it perpetuates the discussions around wellness and health and, and, and you know, it's a very privileged viewpoint in my perspective and, and you really illustrate that nicely. So I guess, Lauren, what's the cure to this virus? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think we've we've had several sort of um, examples kind of sprinkled throughout this conversation already on things to do. One is that we have to recognize that this is a problem, right? Racism, um, systems of oppression are a problem. And I start with, with anti-Black racism in particular because I actually think that that is the foundation by which all other levels and, and sort of um, evolutions of hate sort of derive from. And so I think if we could eliminate anti-Black racism globally, I think all of the forms of oppression would drop like dominoes. 
And so I think that first and foremost, it takes calling that out. It takes recognizing that, yes, we are in the year 2020. Yes, there have been some milestones by Black people and people of color, but that does not absolve this world of the fact that there is still a system that disproportionately pushes down an entire group of people who only want to have the opportunity to live the same life as everyone else. Mm. Um, so I think first calling it out. I think second is um, not ignoring the small ways that we allow racism to chip away at society every single day. We would call those microaggressions, right? And it's come up in a couple of different ways. Liz talked about um, jokes, right? And jokes in, in sort of a, a boardroom type setting and, and how someone might chuckle along and not really call anything out. Um, Amy talked about using racial slurs perhaps in a um, grant or in some sort of written academic product, right? It is those small digs, those small digs give the the okay or the nod to the fact that you can continue along with that behavior. It is those small drops of water that lead to a waterfall that that creates these entire cascading moments of a police officer kneeling on a black man's neck until he dies underneath his underneath his weight. And so it is so important and I cannot overemphasize this enough. It is, it is so important that we not sit back in any of our positions at any point in our lives and allow small insidious insults um, on race, on, on gender, on sexual identity. We, we cannot allow that hmm. because that signals to people that additional egregious behaviors are okay. And, and third, I think that it's important for all of us to take an inventory of our privilege. Um, I actually did an exercise um, when I was in graduate school where a mentor of mine made me really think about and press, pushed me to think about my levels of privilege. I actually was a little naive in thinking, I'm a Black woman in America. I don't know that I have any levels of privilege, but I do, right? I am able-bodied. I, I practice the, the sort of uh, dominant religion here, Christianity. So there are, there are other levels of, of privilege that all of us have. Even with marginalized identities, we still have privilege. And I think it's important for us to, have, um, to take inventory of that. And so that keeps me aware of my privilege. So when I'm in a conversation or in a room with people who are making remarks about perhaps um, a community, and I have privilege in that community, right? That holds me accountable, again, for calling that out as a microaggression. Mm. It's interesting where you raise point to the, the microaggressions, and I mean, really, they're aggressions. Um, and, and we see this yeah. in our education systems, the way that we design our simulations, you know, that's my expertise, is we use stereotypes constantly. We create these courses that are about Indigenous health, that are written by white people. And so we project these continued um, colonial views on the way that we educate our health professionals. And I think that's a whole other conversation that probably warrants a whole other panel um, to talk about that ongoing impact. We've got a question here from the audience, Lauren, that says, let's say we get a different septuagenarian president by the end of the year, how can we progress? Well, first, let me say, Lord, hear our prayer. Um, but, but second, I would say, you know, it's, it is important to realize that this is a system, right? And so changing the leadership is important, but it is not the, the end all be all, right? It is a step. But until we are challenging the way that these systems operate in the United States and also globally, until we are deconstructing and reconstructing something totally new, um, I don't think it's enough for us to sit back on our laurels. And so I, I am hopeful, I'm hopeful, praying and also hopeful that we will have a change in leadership. Um, I don't think it's a guarantee. And I don't think any of, any of us um, Americans or anyone globally, I don't think that we can, we can bank on that. Um, and, and even so that is not the root of the problem, right? That is sort of just the, the top layer of the challenge. Um, but it is not ultimately the root of the problem. 
Yes, great point. Um, each of you has given me so much to think about and I'm feeling simultaneously inspired and challenged. You've, each of you has also thrown out a number of calls to action to our audience listening today. And I guess before we wrap up, I just want to throw to each of you to ask what's one call to action that you would have our viewers go away and consider? We'll start with you, Kate. All right. Um, I think there's too much passivity. I think that everyone is too passive. They tend to sit in their own little bubble. They will think that they're a very good person, but they don't necessarily go out of their comfort zone to make a difference. So I would challenge everyone to get out of their comfort zone, to look at their privilege and see where they can help people who may not have as much privilege as them. Even if it makes you feel uncomfortable, even if people laugh at you or come back with a retort. It's really important that we all stand up for what is right. And this is true of both racism and um, sexism. I think we need to get out of our comfort zones and stop being passive. Liz. For, for me, I believe that human rights starts at home. So it's how we act in the family that's absolutely critical. So I would call on everyone um, today to um, do a number of things. One is to look at how they're acting in their own interactions with people, not just in the family but outside. Are they modelling any racist behaviour? Are they modelling any sexist um, uh, behaviour? Because that will be passed on um, to their children. And I would ask people to, um, to, to really teach their children about equality I mean, people say, oh, well, what will be your biggest achievement, Liz? Well, it actually will be raising two children who fundamentally, fundamentally believe that equality is the only way. I mean, I think that's the greatest gift that I'll leave the world. And I think if we, every one of us did that, um, we would be, you know, we hopefully we'd be in a, a totally different situation. Let's remember, this is our opportunity. Now is the moment because you know, a lot of the old systems and structures have been broken, the mindsets are changing. We can either decide to go backwards or we can create something which is inclusive of every one of us. And that's where I want to be. Thank you, Liz. How about you, Amy? Yep. Um, yeah, so I think um, reiterating what the others are saying, love it. Um, I would say that too many people think of themselves as neutral and apolitical. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are in the medical profession, the media you consume, the books that you choose to keep in your home, it's all political. The research that you build your practice off, it's political. So I think I would say, like, you have so much power, so don't lose hope. These things that we're talking about can make you feel really drained and uncomfortable. And if you are privileged enough that these aren't going to be your experiences, you might be tempted to click off. But we don't want you to click off. We want you to remember that you have power, that you should have hope. And I would challenge you to go into your own homes tonight and see if you have anything in your home written by an Indigenous or a black person, not about by white people, but by an Indigenous or a black person. If you've got kids, check your children's shelves. If you've got an office, go through your office shelves. If the only media, if the only literature, if the only studies that you are consuming are written by white people for white people, you are missing out on so much diversity, so much beauty and so much important information that will only make your practice wherever you are in the health field much better. So I would challenge you to go and check and then go and add to your bookshelves some Indigenous and Black-led literature. Love it. And Lauren, what are your takeaways? Um, I think first and foremost, have hard conversations. Um, mm -hmm. I think know the difference between a discussion and a debate. A discussion being one in which you're hearing both sides, a debate being one in which you are vehemently defending your point of view. Mm -hmm. I think more of us need to be open to discussion to understand where the pitfalls of, of misunderstanding lie um, and less prone to debate. Um, I also wanna encourage, especially this, this audience, um, medical professionals often have you know, wealth and a lot of economic clout. Um, it's important to not only support black and indigenous communities um, 
sort of in practice, but but also economically, right? Invest in businesses, shop by shop in places that are owned by Black and Indigenous people and women, um, and especially if they're all three, right? The intersectional identity, um, and invest in. Um, economic development for for these communities, right? It's not enough for us to just say, I have diverse friends, right? You need to actually put some put some investment in that. And that also helps redistribute power by redistributing wealth. Thank you, Lauren. I'd like to take the time to thank each of our panelists today for contributing your valuable thoughts and experiences and just acknowledge the, the labour that it does take to bring this to the table. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, ComBank, and I want to thank you, our viewers, for joining us for these challenging conversations. I hope you feel inspired to go out and influence change in your place of work. This has been Coda Zero.